Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. Easter Sunday, the resurrection of our Lord, falls on April 9th, 2023. And the texts are Matthew 28, 1 through 10, John 20, 1 through 18, Acts 10, 34 through 43, the psalm is 118 verses 1 through 2, and then skipping ahead to 14 through 24. And finally, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Happy Easter, Happy friends. Easter. Happy Easter. And to yes. our listeners and viewers and preachers out there who are capping off probably a very busy liturgical and, and preaching week. So let's get right to it and get to the best named of all of the Gospels, Matthew. Uh -huh. And we have uh, a choice. You know, you can do Matthew, you can do John, you could do both if you're feeling a little gluttonous. And Matthew 28, 1 through 10. Not a lot of resurrection material in Matthew's Gospel, so you get almost all of it here. It, it all unfolds pretty quickly uh, as Matthew tells it, but... Uh, what else do we need to know for people who are all in with Matthew? Which means gift of God, by the way, in Hebrew, in case anybody's wondering what the name Matthew means. I love your references today. Uh, as gift I of God. Like a gift from God is what it means. You it, Indeed, I have, you are, Matt. <laughs> Indeed. You I haven't are. run across Caroline in scripture yet, so you gotta you got to take it when you can get it. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, there are I, I, about you, Matt, though. <laughs> well, a couple of things I think that are worth mentioning when it comes to Matthew's resurrection, and that is it, that the great earthquake. I think that uh, that detail of Matthew's of Matthew's telling of this is important in that it just calls attention to the fact that. There, there, there's the earth is sh is completely shaken, you know, of, from this event. Like it's a cosmic event, and and nothing can go back to the way it was before. And that the that that empty tomb, the stone being rolled away, has changed everything. And so that that you know that um, detail of the earthquake, I think really gives you a, a, a picture and a feeling of it too. I mean, this is, this is also, I've been working a lot with the trauma or with the resurrection narratives through the lens of trauma. And, uh, and that, because we recognize that, you know, both of them, Mary Magdalene and Mary were at the foot of the cross and now they go to the tomb. They don't go to the tomb to like in Mark to bring spices they go to see the tomb and this is what they see and this is what they experience. So somehow the sermon needs to, I think, kind of capture that, uh, kind of capture that uh, earthquaking, the, 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 the ground underneath you is completely shifting. And, uh, and how do you, and that's what resurrection is about. I, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but I remember a long time ago when my mom and I happened to be preaching on the same Sunday, and we are the name of our sermon was Easter is an earthquake, yeah. and uh, we, we just went with that that whole metaphor of how how Easter is experienced as this earthquake. And we lived in California, so it, it, I had been through a few earthquakes in my time. But yeah, that's what that's my first that's my first reaction to this uh, Easter. I see. I appreciate that, Caroline. I similarly uh, paid attention to uh, the earthquaking, uh, um, the fear and sh being shook uh, of the guards, uh, and and so that uh, disruption, that cosmic shift that you just described, um, and and it caused me to pay attention to uh, first of all. Um, you talked about the trauma we all are living in in this moment or, or what uh, your words made me think of how we can uh, parallel that to the trauma that we all are living in right now. Um, but also the fact that we are having um, a, a climate based um, unexpected uh, weather patterns um, 
Uh, you talked about California. California is at the edge of its drought now um, with the snow-capped mountains and now floods. Um, what does it mean when nature itself actually draws attention to the traumatic moment that moment that humans are experiencing. And I, I think that, I think that we could work with that. Uh, it caused me to pay attention to, um, the dawn in a different way. You know, we, we always told the story at the sunrise, uh, Easter service, but dawning, uh, just as a, um, a, a 24 hour seasonal, um, that is, is another cosmic shift. Uh, and then the seasonal idea, again, going back to the snow capped mountains, uh, that the dazzling was as white as snow. Um, and so to, um, shift into thinking about seasons, to thinking about nature, to thinking about the cosmic, um, transformation that the resurrection and the rumors of the resurrection, which I'll say more about later, um, uh, uh, ignited, I think is, uh, is one option that, that preachers can take this year. Matthew's also got this interest in the guards, uh, back in the end of chapter 27, there's mention of how Pilate made the choice to, to post guards there. Later on, there's going to be a report back to Pilate about the tomb being empty. And so here you have also these guards, which I think is significant in the in the way this scene draws attention to the power of the resurrection over the power of imperial strength or political strength. But you've also got a kind of humiliation of that mm. power. You've got the humiliation of these guards who had one job, uh, which they utterly failed at, had no chance. I imagine this messenger from God sitting on the stone with his arms crossed, you know, <laughs> uh, a little bit of a grin on his face as the, you know, the guards tremble and then, you know, pass out. But it's also, I think, more more to the point of, of Easter, a reminder that Easter is political as well as it's cosmic. And what I mean by that is Easter offers the promise of a new community, right? Of a new way of being in the world, a new way of forming society that's, that's alternate, that's counter. And it, it gets to the effects of resurrection. This is more than just, you know, good news, happiness, more life whatever it's also the idea of new relationship new community and with that a whole new well governance i mean in some ways we're jumping ahead to the ascension then which uh, is more of a, a johannine and a lucan matter uh, but it's part of what's going to happen at the end of chapter 28 right jesus will be, be ready to ascend and will then commission followers uh, to to make disciples, to make new citizens of this new reign that um, that's bursting in. I think another, yeah, I like that a lot. I think another uh, another direction one could go is the the response in verse eight, and that so they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples, and so that pattern of of our response of fear, joy, and obedience. Uh, and I wonder if that, if a preacher could do something with that as well, that our response to the resurrection is, it, it is maybe fear at first because what on earth is going on? And then, and then that recognition of joy of, of the way in which uh, that God has, uh, you know, God has, undone death and and all that death brings and then that response that you talked about matt of this is going to be about making disciples and so they go they they go and announce this they they respond obediently to that charge and jesus will have you know a charge for them the disciples at the end of the gospel so yeah i think maybe a preacher could do something like fear joy obedience and how does that how does that play out for uh, our response now to the meaning of the resurrection in our lives? And another parallel in terms of that, um, uh, this goes back to what you were saying, Matt, uh, is the similarities in which we often read of Matthew, of uh, Moses and Jesus. And so when you talked about the guards, 
um, and uh, the lack of military might. Uh, once again, that's what you have in this story. It's it's similar to uh, the liberation of the enslaved Israelites that uh, um, the greatest empire's army uh, could not overshadow uh, God's liberation and acts of liberation uh, that followed uh, a um, cosmic shift in terms of nature, um, both in terms of, uh, that, well, just listing out the plagues, um, which results in the same thing that you just noted, Caroline, in the sense it results in awe, being awestruck in the awful kind of way, fear, um, but also fascination that leads you to say, I've got to tell somebody. And so the Exodus story becomes the narrative for uh, the promises of God throughout the history of ancient uh, Israel, just as this liberating story of God's conquering death becomes the ongoing narrative that is told by the disciples of Jesus. So I'm including the women as the disciples going to tell the other disciples and we as those disciples going to tell. And that is our obedience. I, I love the way what you guys just said can pair up uh, uh, as a way for folks to work in this text. Yeah. We should probably move on. We've got a lot of, uh, a lot of resurrection narratives. Yeah. John so, 20. This shows up yeah. every now and then on Easter, doesn't it? Every, every <laughs> Easter. Yeah. The alternate text. So that's what a preacher, I think, needs to uh, choose where they sense uh, the, the resurrection story, the resurrection narrative. Where, where is it landing with their people this year? And what we get in uh, John are, you know, some familiar, obviously some familiar themes. But uh, again, just to one thing that I've been thinking about with this story this year again, through the lens of trauma, is to recognize that Mary come, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb alone, which is unique to John. I mean, it's really obvious, but then it's not. You like, you kind of have all of the all of the gospels in your head, and you're like, oh yeah, the women, the women, the women. No, it's just her uh, at this moment, and and maybe that's a place that you sit for a little bit, and you know, uh, she, I, I come to the garden alone. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> The beautiful hymn. I have a, actually, I have a video of, this was two Easter's ago where I was out at my sister's and my, I have a video of my dad singing that. On, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, I'll have to watch that later, but, uh, but she goes to the tomb alone and the, the image of darkness is really powerful here. We know that in the Gospel of John of light representing being in a relationship with God and darkness representing, you know, that absence of, of God uh, and or that uh, not being in a relationship with God. And here it's not Mary Magdalene, not it's not her, you know, um, it's not we don't question her relationship with God. But or with Jesus, but to what extent the darkness represents, she wonders if if Jesus is still present in that relationship. And so it it uh, that because she you know she also goes empty handed to the tomb, no reason. I mean, burials already happen, and uh, and just that need that that need to go to the tomb, and what is she there for, and alone, and uh, and so somehow how a sermon can capture that, uh, that moment for her, I think would be powerful. There's an incredible attention to detail in uh, uh, John's uh, narrative here. And uh, if we uh, pay attention to those details, starting as you did, uh, Caroline, um, particularly if this is uh, the text for a sunrise service, I once heard a sermon on the, the, the title of the sermon was, uh, how can it be Easter if it's still dark outside? And to linger in the detail of darkness, um, to recognize that going into the tomb, uh, where we often will think of it as highlighted by some um, uh, almost uh, um, Hollywood type uh, spotlight uh, to show the emptiness that going into that tomb would have been walking into a dark space. 
uh, depending on, you know, uh, how, how early in the morning it, it was. And, um, and then uh, to be able to uh, parallel that with the reality of the darkness that we are currently live in, living in. Um, again, uh, as you have pointed out, uh, Caroline, uh, John uses this uh, alternative between light and darkness and uh, paying attention to the details through this particular narrative uh, could allow uh, uh, the preacher to do just that with their congregation, to do that parallel between light and darkness and the various details that come up to move toward um, not knowing um having hope but not knowing what to hold that hope into and then seeing that absolutely everything that was done will have a new meaning of of uh, continued hope in the future so from the linens that were the wrapping they're still there but they signal something different now uh, when the body is not there and and just walking through uh, the details in that way might be a way to bring a new reading of this text I find John so helpful to remind me that this is not a story about um, a friend coming back to life and getting more more years added on or more time added on. But this is this is the resurrection is a story about not just Jesus's own pass, passage into new life, but also how he is the source uh, of that life. And I, I I find this largely through the Mary's confusion uh, about his identity, but then more so the, the line stop clinging to me, right. Or typically translated, don't hold on to me or don't touch me. But I, that, that, that imperative has the sense of stop doing what you're doing, stop clinging, stop, which, uh, you know, and of course, I think we talk about this every year, right. And in art has been this kind of hands off, don't touch me in a lot of at least uh, classical medieval art, but it's more of this idea of there's so much more in store, right? Stop clinging on to me. I don't get used to this. This is a temporary thing. Your ability to be with me and to touch me and to talk with me. Uh, I yet have more work to do. And that more work is to, I don't know the right word to use here. I want to say almost kind of secure the fullness of what eternal life is going to look like. And for that, he has to return to the father. So as much joy as Easter brings on a Sunday morning and needs to be celebrated, I think a good sermon on John also has to bring up this, um, but there's still more yet to come, right? Mm -hmm. This is not the final chapter of the story, nor is even something like Pentecost, the final chapter of the story. It's this idea that Jesus now is just going to become, well, to use his language from earlier in the gospel, right? The source of eternal life is gushing out of him, the source of, of newness. And I don't know how to capture that in, in words alone, <laughs> except to keep saying it over and over again, but it's something I think is is really true to John 20 and, and something that a lot of us miss, at least I tend to, on Easter Sunday because it's more about surprise or fear, joy, obedience. I mean, those kinds of things that are also part of the story, but I think John wants us to see what's next. Absolutely, and that that ties into uh, another thought I had, or I probably say this every year as well. But that we all forget. Don't worry, <laughs> everybody forgets. But, <laughs> good, please forget because because he doesn't tell her to say she doesn't go back and say Christ is risen, He is risen indeed, Hallelujah. Uh, the 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 best is yet to come, if you will, in terms of the ascension. I am preparing a, a place, an abiding place for you, John 14, 2. And so the ascension really is the is the necessary uh, next step for that abundant life, John 10, 10. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think is important with this is the her response. She doesn't, she she doesn't go and say, Christ is risen, he's risen indeed, hallelujah. She doesn't go to the disciples and say what Jesus told her to say. <laughs> she goes and says, I have seen the Lord. And I think that that is a, a beautiful resurrection witness because it's not about understanding it or explaining it. She doesn't recognize Jesus, which is which is typical of trauma, of confusion and disorientation, inability to integrate and, 
and put things together. But she simply, it, but she takes that confession and it's not a third person confession. Christ is risen, but it's her own. Mm-hmm. I have seen the Lord and what that means and what that's going to mean has yet to come as well. And so I think a sermon on John would invite those confessions too from people. Where have they, uh, uh, that I have seen that the resurrected Lord and what difference does that make? Um, how do we listen for those I have seen the Lord moments uh, as an ongoing promise of the resurrection past Easter Sunday is another direction. Absolutely. If, if we were just uh, for um, context, I guess, uh, because I, I, I very much would preach uh, from uh, either of the gospels uh, for Easter Sunday. Um, but for the context of understanding what that means uh, going forward, what that has meant going forward, um, I think uh, reading Acts or having that in your imagination, what is Peter telling, um, uh, saying to them um, a- as he speaks to now this growing um a group of respondents to the rumors of the resurrection. And that's, that's where we are today. We are speaking of this past event to the next generation of uh, those who are responding to the rumors of the resurrection. And, and so I think it's important to remember what all that God has done in Jesus and all that God is doing in Jesus. And, um, to keep that at least in our imagination as we rehearse uh, for our congregations, the, the, the gospels, whether it's Matthew or John. Good segue, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> you set I'll me say, up. I was like, oh, I'm going to do it now. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's good. And I, I, I have only one comment on an X and then I want to hear what, I want to hear what Matt thinks, but I, it, it's kind of, I, I can't remember if I read Same this in the I comment. last year. <laughs> uh, I can't remember if I read this in the commentary in, in the commentary online or somewhere, but that you kind of get the what Peter offers here is kind of the Cliff Notes version, right mm-hmm. of, of of what of what Jesus uh, of what Jesus' life and death me death and life and life and death and resurrection mean, and I think uh, that's what I would want a, a resurrection sermon to do is to say what is your Cliff Notes version if somebody said you know. Uh, what does Jesus mean for you that, that you had this, you could, you could do what Peter did, <laughs> uh, but in your own words, that's, I think that's what this text invites. Matt, Acts Cause guy. Because we, we forgot what you said last year. Yeah. And Matt, so, Matt also has a couple of books on Acts, so. He, he has a few ideas. <laughs> he has a few ideas. Yeah, so if you're looking of... for resources, he's your guy. Absolutely. Kind of a one-trick pony. Uh, if it helps, I forgot what I said last year too. I, uh, every year I forget more and more. So, uh, you're, Joy, you're absolutely right that it's the, the the idea of how do we not just preach what would it have been like to be there in the garden or to be at the tomb, right? But the perspective where we're at today, where we're about witnessing and telling, and uh, I, I do worry that when Christian preaching and liturgy tends toward too much of let's all imagine we're in the first century for a while Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and now let's go back out and live our lives there's a value to that obviously but but where's the risen christ today is a question that should be asked on easter and through the whole easter season and how is the risen christ yet still at at work and the x10 text is a really helpful way of thinking about that um Right, no sermon's generic. No sermon is, no good sermon can be lifted up out of context and preached somewhere else, right? And kind of passed around, uh, although we try. And maybe I've, I've preached the same sermon in multiple places, but no good sermon is supposed to. And this is not a generic sermon, although it might look generic. It might look Cliff Notes ish. It's a sermon given to the first Gentile converts and his household, his friends, his associates. And it's, um, it's therefore the sermon that is preached at a moment where not just Cornelius realizes, but Peter realizes, by extension, the entire church realizes that God's movement in the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus and the giving of the Spirit 
is indeed truly universal and indeed truly global. And this is all a divine act. So Jeremy Williams' commentary does a great job underscoring all of the God language, all of God's agency. But it's also a reminder, I think, to us, right? And this is, I think, the trick to preaching or, or the, the challenge of preaching is how do we talk about Easter as, as, as part of God's larger movement to reclaim all peoples? Uh, how do we so kind of move toward that more cosmic or that more universal aspect of it? Uh, and to reclaim all peoples in a shared existence, right? This is going to create a bond between Cornelius and Peter and their people that's going to cause trouble. <laughs> it's going to be difficult to na navigate, but it's going to finally be what the church is, is about. I mean, Cornelius experiences that possibility. Cornelius is brought into this new, not just understanding, but this new life and this new society not because of Peter's faithfulness, but because of the God who raises Jesus from the dead, that that God who raises Jesus from the dead is still about the business of stretching the church, building inclusion, building ways in which new unity is discovered. And um, that's a, that's a, that's a whole Easter season topic, I think, to explore, yeah. but it's something you could at least bring up maybe with, with this text. So, sorry, that was a mini sermon right there. You can just, just like feel a it. generic sermon. <laughs> you just pick up and drop in your context, but. Okay. Uh, that's what I think. You know, it's, it's, you know, so what that this is a divine act? Well, the so what is, what if God's still doing stuff like this for people that we thought were beyond the reach or for people that are too strange or too different or for people who are too alienated from the, the core of what we understand Christian community to look like? If we've ever said the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then God's still doing that.